a lay of the land in the American League Central as we get to the stretch run, plus a series preview for the Twins in a very important four-game set with the Texas Rangers at Target Field. It's all coming up on today's episode of Locked On Twins. You are Locked On Twins. Your daily Minnesota Twins podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. And welcome to the Lockdown Minnesota Twins podcast. Today is Thursday, August 18th, and I'm your gracious host, Nash Walker. Thanks for making Lockdown Twins your first listen every day on the Lockdown Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. Again, this is Nash Walker, season three, on a daily basis, breaking down the Twins for Lockdown Twins and writing about the Twins at TwinsDaily.com. Here's the lay of the land for you in the American League Central The dust has settled on an off day for the Twins, and here's what we're looking at. Cleveland is in first place at 63 and 55. In first place, your or in second place, your Minnesota Twins at 61 and 55. There's some important distinctions in these standings, and we're going to get to those. Third place, Chicago at 61 and 58. They're two and a half games back. The Twins one game back of the division leader, Cleveland. But Cleveland. And the Twins are tied in the loss column. Cleveland's played two more games than the Twins, which is wild considering Cleveland had to make up so many games with their doubleheaders. Now they've played more games than the Twins, two more, and those two games they won. But they're tied in the loss column. The White Sox have as many wins as the Twins at 61, but they're three back in the loss column. So they've played three more games than the Twins, and they've lost all three of those games. So that is important. Like The loss column is vital. It's more important in the standings because losses are banked. You can't make up for losses. You, uh, The White Sox need the Twins, by definition, to lose. The Twins are in control at 61 and 55 over the Sox. And Cleveland is 63 and 55. So the Twins make up those two games with two wins. They're in control. They're tied up. They have their, they have it in front of them. You know, they still control this thing in the central. And that's, Kind of my point with the standings here is, yes, the Twins are a game behind, and yes, the White Sox are only two and a half games behind, but the Twins and, and Guardians both have 55 losses, and the White Sox have 58, and I think that's that's certainly significant. It's not everything. like They can make that up in, in a series, right? But it's, it's interesting, especially with the White Sox winning the first two against Houston. They then lost the next two and got blasted 21-5 to today by the Astros. I can't say I didn't love seeing that. I love seeing that. This is a big weekend. I might say that every show. This is a big week. This is a big weekend. This is a big month because it is like we're into August. We're getting into late August. This is crunch time right now. And this is also a big weekend because the White Sox and Guardians have a three-game series in Cleveland. They only play each other three more times after this weekend. The Twins play the Rangers for four. They have a wraparound series. I thought the game was Thursday, but it wraps around to Monday. So it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday for the Twins. The White Sox and Cleveland will battle. That'll be Lance Lynn, Tristan McKenzie, Johnny Cueto, Shane Bieber, and Dylan Cease, uh, Aaron Savali in those three games. When they're done this weekend, they only have three more matchups. The Twins have 17 combined matchups with Chicago and Cleveland. And after this weekend, they'll only play each other three more times. The Twins will play Chicago nine more times. They'll play Cleveland eight more times. They have a lot more games against those two. And after this weekend, the schedule is going to be like really shifted in that direction. They'll have 42 games left after this Rangers series. And 17 of them will be against the Guardians and White Sox. Almost half the schedule remaining will be against the Guardians and White Sox. And it's almost like they have double as many games remaining because those games are doubly important. This this is fun. It's a three-team race. And when those two play each other, you wonder, like, who should you be cheering for? Who should you hope wins? Before, it was obvious to me. A month ago, it was obvious to me. I'm cheering for the Guardians. I hope they beat the White Sox because I see the White Sox as a bigger threat in this division. But we're into mid-August, like, do you still feel that way? Do I still feel that way? I, I don't know. I, I think preferably Cleveland takes two out of three this weekend. And the reason for that, because the White Sox are two and a half games back in this division, 
even if Cleveland swept this weekend, I think that'd be okay for the Twins as long as they take care of their business. If you can somewhat, you're not going to bury the White Sox this weekend, but if you can bury the White Sox, I think the plan here, like my hope for the Twins in this division was the one of the two teams or both of them together, whether it was the White Sox and the Twins, the, the Twins and the Guardians, would eliminate the third team. The third team is eliminated, and then it's just me and you, and we're going to play each other. Now I just got to beat you, and the, the third team is irrelevant at that point. The White Sox won't be eliminated this weekend, but if they're five and a half games back, five and a half games back of Cleveland with 40-something games remaining, it's not insurmountable by any means. Teams have made up eight games before in divisions, right? The Twins, even. It's not insurmountable, but you just feel differently about the race. And then the Twins are in the driver's seat, and the Guardians are in the driver's seat, too, and you're kind of co-drivers together. And, and if the Twins take care of their business against Texas, you can kind of keep pace with the Guardians. Uh, probables this weekend in Texas, before we preview this series, Martin Perez, Dylan Bundy, Glenn Otto, Chris Archer, Kohei Arihara, and Joe Ryan, and Cole Reagans and Sonny Gray. So what to expect this weekend? We got an update on Tyler Malley, and then a little debate later on. Should the Twins make a change at the closer spot? With Jorge Lopez a little bit shaky, should that be a change the Twins make down the stretch in this very important time in the American League Central race. Let's get to all of that after this word from NHTSA. You're hanging out with some friends and putting back drinks. A few becomes a few too many. As the evening comes to an end and people start to head out, you think of calling for a ride. Nah, you live nearby. You can make it home okay. It's no big deal. What are the odds you'll get pulled over anyway? And even so, what's the worst that could happen? Your insurance goes up. You lose your license. You lose your job. You total your car. You kill someone. Don't do it. If you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. Police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads to save lives. Drive sober or get pulled over. Non-negotiable. Series preview. Four games set. Wraparound series to Monday. I don't like these. My brain doesn't understand these because I think in, in terms of weeks, you got a three-game series Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, off day Thursday, three-game series on the weekend. Or you have four games into Thursday, and then you have a, th a three-game series on the weekend. Or you have Monday off. I like clean weeks. This ain't going to be a clean week, but I'm not complaining about four games against the Texas Rangers. It is very important when you play teams. That's I think last year was a forgotten part of the 2021 twins. If you remember, and I'm sure you don't, and I don't really remember super well, but I know that in April and May, the twins constantly played teams that were on like 10 game winning streaks. Like Oakland hadn't lost in uh, 10 plus games. They had some ridiculous streak going on when Luis Arise threw that ball up the line to blow the game in Oakland. That's like the one memory of the 2021 season that I want to, uh, or that I think of when I think of April. They played teams that were hot constantly, like teams that were playing their best baseball of the season. The Twins would run into them in the first half last year. And I think the good news is they're playing a Rangers team that's 6-10 and 10 in August. The biggest threats on that team, pitching, hitting everything, are Marcus Semien and, and Corey Seager. Those two in the series in Texas, Seager was on fire. He was on fire in that series, and he went 6-9 for nine with three home runs against the Twins in Texas. He was basically why the Rangers won that series, him and Marcus Semien. Those two together in that series were 9 for 21 with four home runs, a double, a triple, and 10 runs driven in. Those two together when the Twins played the Rangers at Globe Life Field in Arlington. You can't let them do that. And the good news is Semien in August is hitting 182 with a 233 on base percentage. He's slugging 364. He's been terrible in August. He's the type of hitter. He ha he's streakier where he's on the fastball and he can he he's as dangerous as anybody. He was on a, a heater all year last year with the Blue Jays and he got on one again this year, but it's been up and down. He came out of the gate very slow, then was very good and now recently hasn't been good. And Seager Seager's always good. I mean, Seager's always a tough out, but when when you only maybe have to worry about one of them cuz Semyon's been struggling so much, that changes the scope. And like I said, this is an offense that's hitting 250 with a 319 on base percentage. 
They're slugging 368 in August. That's their line. 250, 319, 368 in August. Like OPS under 700 in August. They're not really hitting as a team. And, and their team ERA is 434 in this month. So they're coming in. They lost two in a row to Oakland. They're coming in not playing well. And that's a good thing for the Twins. And I, I think sometimes that's overhyped because just beat them. Like even if they are, like just beat them. But other times you want to play teams when they're on their downswing. You would prefer to play teams on their downswing every single series. It feels like when the Yankees are on a downswing like they're on right now, they get the Twins and then everything's okay. That happened last year at Target Field. Um, but the Rangers are certainly on a downswing. And this is a very top-heavy lineup. If you can get through the top of the lineup, and now that Semyon has not been very good, I think that'll be a little bit easier. If you can get through the top of this lineup, you're going to be okay. And I said that in the Angel series. If you can get through Shohei Otani, you're going to be okay. He homered. He had a, a really nice game on Sunday. He didn't necessarily win it for the offense. They got some big hits from guys you wouldn't expect. I feel that way about the Rangers' top of the lineup. If you can get through Semyon and Seager and you know Nathaniel Lau's okay and Jonah Heim's okay at the plate, if you can get through those guys, you're probably home free. I and mean, it's baseball. Anything could happen. But if Seager or Semyon, if they don't beat you, it's hard for me to envision the Twins losing this series. Here are the starters they're going to see. Martin Perez has had an excellent year. He did give up six runs to the Twins in Texas. They know him super well. But the biggest difference between Perez this year and in the past, he's not given up any homers. He's always been a high home run guy as a lefty. Middle, middle, command, sometimes spotty. He's a nibbler and, and would have to come in, and guys would beat him with homers. It's gone way down this year. He's been excellent. He's the toughest starter the Twins will see this weekend, and they beat him up for six runs in Texas. I mean, I'm not really scared of Martin Perez, but he's the toughest starter the Twins will see. Glenn Otto on uh, Saturday has made 18 starts. He's got a 496 ERA. FIP is at 546, and he's walking 13% of hitters, right-handed twins, very good against right-handed pitchers. Kohei Arihara, right-handed career, 641 ERA and 11 starts. And then Cole Raggins is a rookie lefty, and these are his numbers this year on Monday. 14 and a third, 13 hits, eight earned runs, four home runs, eight walks, and seven strikeouts. I'm not concerned about any of the starters the Twins will face this weekend, which is nice because they have had some difficult matchups. They've faced some really tough pitchers this year, but this weekend, there's no excuse this weekend for the offense. Perez has been good, and I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if he put together another quality start on Friday night, and that's the toughest matchup is Perez Bundy, but Bundy's got a sub-4 ERA over his last 10 starts, and he's given them a chance to win for the most part. The Perez Bundy matchup, I think things line up super well for the Twins in this series. And I'm going to tell you why after this word from Liver Health Formula. Did you know the key to sustainable weight loss is through your liver? The liver is the body's metabolic furnace. It's responsible for flushing out harmful toxins and igniting your fat burning metabolism. But thanks to modern diets, rich in unhealthy processed foods, and constant exposure to thousands of man made and environmental toxins, most of us have overworked livers. But now it's easy to rejuvenate your liver health and reignite your metabolism thanks to Liver Health Formula by Pure Health Research. Liver Health Formula contains eight liver boosting super nutrients like turmeric, beet, and artichoke extract. No more feeling tired and low on energy all the time. No more uncomfortable digestion. And best of all, Liver Health Formula makes it easier to maintain a healthy body weight long term. Go to getliverhelp.com slash MLB to learn more. Again, that's getliverhelp.com slash MLB to try liver health formula completely risk-free. On paper, terrific matchups for the Twins. At home, four-game series. You swept the Royals. The Rangers are not playing good baseball. Semyon's been ice cold. The four starters you're going to see are not imposing. You know, Three of them are definitely not imposing in Otto, Arihara, and Reagans. You got Ryan and Sonny Gray going on Sunday and Monday. Those matchups are favorable. I just am not, I'm not concerned about this series, but I haven't been concerned about other series. I wasn't concerned about the Angels series, really, and look what happened. Anything could happen, but it's four games. You got a larger sample. I'll be surprised. I'll be surprised if the Twins don't take three out of four here. I mean, a split is the most likely, usually in a four-game series. I think three out of four should be the expectation, um, just with everything, how everything's played out. And I think the Rangers are a better 
bad team. Like they're one of the better bad teams. They're still a bad team and they're not playing well. And one of their best hitters, Simeon, has been terrible. He's got a 233 on base percentage in August and 70 something plate appearances. He could turn it on at any time. He could beat you at any time. I just think these are super, super favorable matchups. Good news. Tyler Malley has shoulder fatigue, shoulder soreness. There's no structural damage. His MRI came back clean. I'm still hesitant about this, about sh his shoulder. Because like lingering shoulder problems, he's already had shoulder issues this year. No question are concerning. Like at any time he could go down with a shoulder problem, right? Or, or be throwing 85. You know, the thing I'm worried about is, he doesn't go on the injured list because it doesn't sound like he'll go on the injured list. He skips a start maybe, like makes a start at a different time next weekend or whatever. My concern is that happens and then he, whatever, you know, what happened on Wednesday, that happens again where he goes out there and he's 86, 87 and Baldelli and Michael Salazar and, and Masa Abe are watching thinking, um, are we going to go get him again? Like is he's, are we going to have to go get him and patch up this game with the bullpen again? Then what do you do? Like, that's my concern <clears throat> that this is going to happen again with his shoulder. And maybe that's just being like paranoid, but this is the second time this year that he's had shoulder problems. And on the same token, how good is he if he's 89, 90? I know he got through the Royals lineup one time that way or whatever, but no strikeouts. I don't think, I think he had one strikeout. How good is he? How effective is he in the low 90s, you know, at the 89, 90, 91, rather than 92, 93, 94, up to 96? I think that's debatable, but I don't think that he's going to be who you expected him to be at a lower velocity. He's just easier to hit, and he's going to have to be more fine with his command. His secondary stuff is pretty, like his splitter is a good pitch. His cutter slash sliders, it's an okay pitch, but he kind of relies on a jumpy fastball. He relies on a fastball that gets on hitters and a big part of that is the velocity, and he needs his velocity. So we'll wait and see. I'm going to be very intrigued when he goes out there next to see what he looks like, and hopefully he looks back to the Tyler Malley we saw in the first couple starts with the Twins. I talked about this the other night, but my episode was so choppy I couldn't even post it. Should Yoan Duran be the set closer? And I've discussed this a little bit, but I think this is something the Twins could get out ahead of, and I think people are going to wonder this. So I, I don't think that he should be. I think it should be Lopez, but I understand the argument that Duran should be the ninth inning guy. People have made that argument for a lot of the year, but it's way different for me now that they have Lopez. They're able to float Duran around in multiple innings, you know, in the sixth and seventh, eighth, whenever you need him to put out a fire, they're able to float him around in different spots. And what that allows you to do, having Lopez allows you to use Duran in the highest leverage spots. I think they feel, and I feel, and a lot of Twins fans feel, that Duran's the best reliever on the team. I mean, he's your most reliable, best, most overpowering, most dominant reliever on the team. Lopez is your second best reliever. And even because Duran is the best reliever, that doesn't mean he's the automatic ninth inning guy. That means we're going to use him in the highest of leverage spots. If the bases are juiced with one out, let's go to Duran against a right-handed hitter. And what before they couldn't do that because they had to save him for the later innings. So it's, it's a debate. Like it's a debate. If he should be pitching the ninth inning, and again, I think he will be pitching the ninth inning. I think he's going to pitch in some ninth innings. I think you're going to see him close games down the stretch for the Twins, especially if Lopez is down. They're going to rely on those guys a ton, though. And the bullpen, Nick Nelson just wrote a piece at TwinsDaily.com, like the 15 most important Twins. And he had like Duran and Lopez and Jackson, Fulmer, a lot of the relievers on the list because the bullpen is vital. The bullpen will be vital. And... Maybe more than anything else, maybe more than anything else, when I look at the end of the year, how they were from this point, August 18th or whatever day it is today, forward in the second half of the season, you might see the most correlation with how their bullpen performs out of anybody else because you can't trust Bunny to go deep. You can't trust Archer to go deep. Ryan really hasn't gone deep in a while. Sonny Gray's gone deeper and you hope that he can. Mally's got the shoulder questions. Ober's coming back, but he's got question marks on his health and Winder as well. You need the bullpen to produce. And that's why, yes, it was so important to go get Michael Fulmer and Jorge Lopez because they knew that. They knew the bullpen would be extremely important. It's more important to the Twins than it is for other teams. And part of that is, you know, sometimes there is a quicker hook on guys, but the reason, the main reason there's a quick hook on Dylan Bundy and Chris Archer 
is because those two guys can't be relied on. They just can't. You can't rely on those two guys beyond whatever you think is viable. Like something then that would what I mean is sometimes I think it's viable for them to go a little bit deeper and and the twins pull them, Baldelli pulls them earlier than I think they should. An overwhelming majority of the time, I'd rather they go to a bullpen arm than keep Dylan Bundy in a game into the sixth or seventh inning. I'd rather they go to a bullpen arm than go to Chris Archer, who has exploded in some innings this year, unable to throw strikes. I would rather they do that on most occasions. Not on all, but on most occasions, I prefer that they do that. It's different with Sonny. It's different with Mally. And it's it's a little bit different with Joe. Not not really, though. I mean, before it was because Joe Joe's getting barreled. Like, Joe's giving up homers. And your concern, if you're up by a run or two in these games, is Joe's going to go out there and walk somebody and then give up a two-run homer and you're going to lose the lead and you feel much more confident that Michael Fulmer or Caleb Thielbar or anybody else except for Pagan is you feel more confident that they're not going to give up a home run than Joe Ryan in that spot or they're not going to give up a run in that spot. I understand that that can tax a bullpen over time and I do think that that's been a factor for the Twins, but I also feel that they have enough good bullpen arms now where they can be aggressive in those spots. And if Dylan Bundy is after five, you're feeling comfortable. I feel much better about them going to the bullpen now than I did before the trade deadline because they have legitimate weapons back there to get out. So it's just going to be about performing and getting it done. Big weekend series. I'm very excited for this. We're going to have Prospect Friday Friday. So join me for that. Looking at the system, my updated top 10 twins prospects and what to expect. This is going to be a big one. It's going to be fun. And I'm going to be here five days a week on the Lockdown Twins podcast. Also, checked out Lockdown Sports Minnesota for our Lockdown Twins postcast. Brandon Warren and I go live after every game. Thanks for making Lockdown Twins your first listen today. Now make your second listen, the Lockdown MLB podcast. MLB expert Paul Francis Sullivan brings humor, passion, and unique perspective on every team and the biggest stories around the league. Follow the number one daily league wide podcast, Lockdown MLB, on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts on the Lockdown Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. Thanks again. Go Twins.